Hey friends, it seems that everyone these days loves real estate, investing in real estate in particular. I want to cover two stocks today, real estate investment trusts, or REITs for short, that offer investors like myself, everyday people, access to the high yields that can come with real estate. These two stocks offer the ability to diversify across thousands of different real estate projects. The first one I want to cover is Realty Income Ticker O. I own this one in my personal portfolio. It's the monthly dividend company. I love this stock because it pays dividends every month that I can use to pay my bills and they own world-class properties. Their leverage isn't too high at all. They have a great balance sheet and this particular company has very low overhead. They only have like a hundred employees or so, even though the market cap is huge. I'm going to get into that later. The reason is they have leverage on their resources because it's a triple net lease company, meaning that the customer, the person renting the real estate actually has to do most of the work. They have to pay the property taxes. They have to pay for their insurance and their utilities, and they have to pay for tenant improvements and maintenance as well. Wow. What a great business model. I want to look at that one first because again, it's the gold standard of real estate investing through REITs, and it gives a good benchmark as to what the investor could expect when looking at REITs. The next stock I want to cover today is a brand new one that I haven't really looked at before, but I'm very familiar with their properties. This is Essex Property Trust, ticker ESS. One of my patrons, corner patrons over on Patreon brought this stock to my attention. I'll link to my corner Patreon below in the pinned comment. Check that out. We have fun meetups there all the time on Zoom on corner Patreon. Also, I just shared my stock portfolio, the percentage allocation to each position. But I love Essex because I'm going to share a photo on the screen right now. Check it out. I was in Foster City, California last week as part of a business trip. Earlier in the week, I was in Los Angeles. It was really wonderful um, being on this business trip. It was very productive and I got to see a lot of teammates. And when I was in Foster City, actually, it was very special because I did a mini meetup with my friends Sam and Mike. I'll uh, throw up a screenshot there of our photo from that meetup. Hey, thank you, Sam. Sam and Mike, it was so wonderful meeting with you two. You are two of my favorite people in the Bay Area. But the reason I'm bringing up Foster City right now is actually Essex Property Trust owns uh, two different uh, properties in that city, and uh, both of them are really wonderful. And so I um, am familiar with their properties, and they own a number of properties throughout the Bay Area, throughout California. They're in infill markets where the land is basically irreplaceable. It is really good infill locations. And when I say infill, I'm talking about scarcity of land. They go towards locations that are very popular and there's just not a lot of land available. And so their buildings and their communities are very valuable. Now, they also operate in Washington as well. So I want to compare Essex to Realty Income a bit because Essex, it's a little bit different. They're an apartment REIT. They have more employees. There's a lot of overhead to manage their properties and their stock is off like 40% from its 52-week high, which is quite exciting to see as a dividend investor. As a dividend investor who loves investing for cash flow, when I see a stock price go down, it always piques my interest. And then, by the way, at the end of the video today, I want to go through some REIT basics, just some basic information about REITs. For those of you who are new, to real estate investment trusts. Get ready, everyone, for a really exciting dividend stock investing video. Welcome to PPCEN. This is Dividend Stock Investing for Everyone. All right, everyone. So I want to start out with a realty income. I think so many of you are familiar with this company, but let's go through it real quick. Check it out on the screen right now. And so realty income trades under ticker O. It's trading at $61.56 right now. I started buying this thing in 2013. And so it's been about 10 years for me. Wow. It's hard to even believe that that's the case. I was buying in the mid thirties, low forties. I've been averaging in over the years though. And um, it's off its 52 week high by about 
about 18.4%, and so it's down a bit. It's caught the attention of a lot of dividend investors. Now with REITs, instead of looking at earnings per share, we like to look at funds from operations. That's a better proxy of the true profitability that's coming through the company in terms of valuing the stock. And AFFO just means adjusted funds from operations. It smooths out cash flow. It adjusts for one-time things. It's kind of like an adjusted EPS, if you will. And so in 2021, they earned 359, which would put them at a price to 2021 AFFO of 17.15. In 2022, they earned 392. For the 2022 calendar year, if I take the price and I divide by 2022 AFFO, they're trading at a 15.7. That's kind of what the PE, if you will, would be for this uh, REIT. And uh, by the way, the reason we don't look at PE or pr uh, price to earnings ratio for REITs is because gap accounting rules... In terms of earnings, it looks at depreciation as a real business cost. But in the real estate arena, depreciation, you are allowed to depreciate buildings over time. And um, when you sell a building, it lowers cost basis. But are the buildings really losing value? Are they really losing value over time? No, depreciation can be great from a tax perspective, but it's, um, it's not really a real thing in many cases where the buildings are actually losing value. And so that's why FFO funds from operations makes sense because it's putting basically the depreciation back. It's not looking at that as something that's subtracted out of the profitability of the company. And hence, PE ratios can look really weird for REITs. And instead, I always search for FFO, AFFO, um, core FFO uh, terms like that. But let's keep going. As you can see on the screen right now, they did provide guidance for 2023. I took the low point of their guidance range, which was 393. Basically, it's trading at a PE equivalent or an AFFO divided by price here of 15.66. Not bad. Now, what's really cool is this is the monthly dividend company. So for those of us who like to pay bills um, right now with dividends and want some consistency in cash flow, the distributions that come from realty income are monthly. And if I annualize those monthly distributions, it's trading at a yield right now of about 4.97%. And worth noting, I put distribution here, not dividend. Sometimes we use these words like dividend, even to talk about distributions that come from REITs or MLPs, Master Limited Partnerships. But when I'm looking at something that is not a qualified dividend stock, I like to use the word distribution because the distributions that come monthly from realty income, they're not qualified dividends, meaning in the US, they're not taxed as long-term capital gains. They're actually taxed... Um, Typically, the lion's share of the distribution would be ordinary income, but oftentimes they include return of capital as well, which needs to be accounted for because it lowers the cost basis of the unit holder, of the REIT holder. And so there are some unique tax consequences for REITs when they're held in taxable accounts. But for those that hold them in retirement accounts, non-taxable accounts, some of that complexity can go away. But for those like me who do own REITs in taxable accounts, because I use realty income right now to help pay for some of my bills, it's important to understand all of these tax nuances. And it's important to understand that the nearly 5% yield that's coming from realty income, it's not a apples to apples 5% versus a 5% I might earn in a qualified dividend stock because qualified dividend stocks, the tax rate is lower. They're taxed as long-term capital gains. But let's keep going. As you can see on the screen right now, the next thing I want to cover for realty income is the growth of the distribution. How has it been doing? Well, over the last five years, it's growing by 3% per year on average. I like to look at realty income as a Lower risk uh, REIT, it's one of those things that in terms of a con, if you will, it's not a fast grower. It's slow, steady, eddy. It's somewhat of like a utility company, if you will. It's not growing the dividend very quickly, but there is some underlying growth there. The starting yield, it's a higher yield, but again, it's not as tax friendly as a qualified dividend. And it's certainly not a high yielder in the scheme of things that high yield investors would even classify as being of higher yield. But a lot of investors love this stock 
because it's a way to invest in physical hard assets. Right now, there's a lot of talk about de-dollarization. There's a lot of talk out there just about currencies. Are they really worth the um, amount that we all think they are? Or are they just empty promises? What investors love historically about real estate is the ability to own tangible assets. And realty income gives just that. It's a very broadly diversified portfolio in the commercial and industrial side of things. Typically, they own the properties that... Um, operate restaurants, uh, convenience stores, they own distribution centers, they own fitness facilities, they own movie theaters. So it's a broad array of commercial and retail. And it's interesting that they are now expanding into Europe as well. They're working on a project I was reading about in their annual report in Italy, and they are now in the gaming industry as well. They have acquired the uh, Win Resort, the Win Encore Resort, not the one in Las Vegas, but the one over in Boston. And so that was really interesting as well. But let's keep going. As you can see on the screen right now, I also want to cover their market cap, which is $40 billion. And so this is a really large REIT and it has grown in market cap over the years. My understanding is they have issued some new shares. So part of the growth in their market cap is just uh, a little bit of dilution there. What's interesting about a real estate investment trust is they can issue shares in addition to taking on debt. And so they have different ways to raise capital for the projects that they are undertaking. And I would say overall on a balance sheet perspective, you can see here I've put assets, I have accumulated depreciation, I have assets minus accumulated depreciation, liabilities, stockholders, equity, and leverage. I want to go through that. So the assets I pulled straight off the balance sheet. I'm pulling all this because this is a gold standard balance sheet. This is the balance sheet by which I wanted to compare Essex. By the way, I went into this analysis today thinking pretty poorly of Essex. I'm not going to fool you. I love their properties, but... And I love the fact that it kind of is a contrarian play. It gives me exposure if I were to buy Essex. It is on my watch list now. Maybe I'll buy it uh, at some point. It's on the watch list because I believe it's a indirect way of investing in technology. They own all of the best apartments, not all of them, but many of the best apartments in areas like Silicon Valley and up in Washington as well, where tech innovation is happening. We know tech industry right now is hurting. We know there have been some layoffs. We know it's affecting this stock. This is the real estate way of getting exposure to a possible future rebound in um, technology. But I went into this thing with Essex thinking, boy, this company is in trouble. Um, I bet you they have a terrible balance sheet. I bet you it does not even compare to realty income. That's why I'm looking at the realty income balance sheet first. But you'll see later actually uh, what I concluded with Essex. It's interesting. So stay tuned. But as you can see on the screen right now with realty income, they've got a lot of assets. They have 49.67 uh, billion in assets. Now, this accumulated depreciation is basically how much the buildings have been depreciated so far, but if they were to sell these buildings, that does a lower cost basis. So that's something to keep in mind. But I don't really look at that as a real um, charge or, or so against the company. It's not a real outflow, if you will. It's not money the company really owes unless they were to sell. And there's a tax consequence. Um, for for the sale. And so long story short, the way I'm looking at this is I'm taking the assets and then I'm uh, subtracting out that accumulated depreciation to get at the real assets. And I think the real assets are more like 54.577 billion. Now I know liabilities are 20.8 billion. And so there is uh, the stockholders equity I'm showing is the real stockholders equity. It's just assets minus liabilities. But here's where it gets interesting. I look at leverage. I'm kind of trying to understand how levered are they? Typically in the real estate industry, I would say someone who's considered low leverage might be in like 25% range. Someone who's kind of higher leverage might be up 50% or even higher. I think 38%. Most people probably say that's kind of lower leverage territory. Um, but anyway, the way I arrive at that is I'm just taking, hey, liabilities, and then I'm dividing that into the true assets, the assets minus the accumulated depreciation. 
and that's how I'm getting at the leverage. And I want to keep that uh, number earmarked because when I look at Essex, I want to look at their leverage as well. How does it compare to realty income? Because I thought maybe their leverage would be um, pretty horrible, but you'll see in a minute. But before I get to that, check it out on the screen right now. I want to show with all of you really quick what the balance sheet looks like. Where did I pull these numbers from? And you can just see here, here is the realty income balance sheet. And you can see over time, their assets are growing, which is amazing. Um, their liabilities are growing as well. So they're using some leverage there, um, some debt to uh, grow their business. Um, you can in particular see that under notes payable net is going up, line of credit is uh, going up. Um, and so that's where I'm pulling it from. But clearly, this is a company in the real estate industry that has managed their debt pretty darn well. Before I go on to Essex, if you're enjoying the video so far, please do go ahead and click the like button. It means the world to me. Also, if you own realty income like I do, put in the comments below what you think. Are you buying any? I'm thinking probably, hey, I'm going to add a little more here just because I haven't in a while. And it's nice to see the stock price trending down. But I want to talk about Essex right now. Let's take a look on the screen. Check it out in front of you right now. This is the same comparable analysis I did for realty income I want to do with Essex. And um, as I go through this, you can see some of the pros and cons on the screen too. I'm showing uh, just some of the things I like and dislike about these companies. I went through most of those with realty income. I think with Essex, what I really like is it would bring apartment exposure to my portfolio that I don't have in this portfolio right now. Everyone needs a place to live. Uh, I really love the fact that their apartments are world-class infill locations, and there just is not that much more land. What some apartment developers are doing these days is they're finding existing facilities and they're tearing them down to build a bigger and better one there. I like with Essex too that surprisingly, I didn't know this about them, 29 years of dividend increases. They're an aristocrat. Um, I'll look at some of the cons in a minute, um, but I'd say the biggest one, honestly, is those West Coast politics. They have a lot of exposure, all their exposure in the West Coast. So that's something for investors just to uh, keep in mind. But let's look at this. The price per share is $213. It is 41.4% off the 52-week high. That is what caught my attention when uh, my patron brought this up to me. I'm like, wow, world-class apartments, great markets, great quality facilities, and it is down. They have something called Core FFO. That is their equivalent to Realty Income's AFFO. It's basically taking funds from operations and it's adjusting it uh, for rent that might be coming in lumpy throughout the year. I imagine that they don't have to adjust as much. Their tenants are um, just people, or average people who live in apartment homes, beautiful, expensive <laughs> apartment homes. And uh, whereas with realty income, they're working more with businesses. So there might be some more uh, nuances to their AFFO. That's just my guess. But anyway, in 2021, they earned $12.49 in, in uh, core FFO. If I take the current price, I divide by that PE or uh, the price to core FFO is 17. 2022, their earnings surged. Great. Uh, their uh, core FFO in 2022 was 14.51. And so if I take the price and I divide it by 2022 core FFO, I get a 14.68. And the projections, the low point of the range for 2023 this year is a 14.53. You can see both with Essex and with Realty Income that the low point of their range for this year, it's basically in line with last year. And so maybe they're expecting a little bit slower growth or maybe they're just sandbagging their projections so no one is disappointed but long story short, their PE equivalent is in the 14s, whereas realty income was in the 15s. So this is trading a little cheaper than realty income. And maybe it's not uh, as broadly diversified as realty income. They're really focused on the West Coast. Their market cap is not quite as big as... Um, either. It's a only $14 billion. And so maybe investors are a little bit more scared of this particular one. Also with all the drama happening in the tech market right now. Let's talk about distributions though. This one is a quarterly payer, not monthly. Uh, they're paying $2.31 a quarter, or $9.24 a year. Their distribution yield is 4.34%. So they have a lower starting distribution yield than realty income. And so that is... Um, 
Not very exciting for an income investor like myself who's trying to skew my portfolio a little bit more towards higher yield these days. That was something off the bat that I was like, huh, is it quite high enough, especially given the fact that the tax situation is going to be complex? In fact, on that topic, I want to show you something really quick. Check it out on the screen right now. This is from Essex from their website. This just goes to show the complexity of their dividends. And so this is the Essex uh, reports the characteristics of their 2020. 22 dividends. And you can see they did four of them. And you can see that some of it is ordinary income or not some, most of it, 80.169%. Like I said earlier, this is ordinary um, taxable dividends if held in a non-retirement account, which is where I would put it uh, for myself. I'm speaking only to my personal journey uh, on this channel. Um, and so that's important to realize it's not a qualified dividend, although there's some portion of qualified, but boy, it looks really, really small as um, a percentage of the total. They have some return, or actually they have no return of capital, and then there's some capital gain as well, but they say 20% rate, 16.7%. Uh, unrecaptured section 1250 capital gain 25% rate. That was 3.05%, so on and so forth. So this is a little tricky. I wanted to show this to all of you because those of you who do have an interest in investing in REITs in a taxable account, this is the type of thing that either you would want to be familiar with firsthand if you file your own taxes, or if you have a tax advisor like I do, this is valuable information that would have to be passed along to the qualified tax advisor. It's a little trickier with the REITs. But let's keep going back to the analysis. As you can see on the screen in front of you right now, the next thing I want to cover in the analysis today is the distribution growth. And so one thing that really was exciting to me about Essex as compared to Realty Income is they are growing the dividend a little quicker. So instead of 3% per year, they're growing it on average by about 4.4% per year. And so that kind of makes up for the lower starting distribution yield. Now the market cap is 14 billion, as I mentioned. So this is a smaller company than Realty Income, but it is again for the investor who has an interest in apartments like I do, um, it's just kind of cool to own apartment buildings. I would definitely say there's an element of the collector in me that brings me to this particular company. Um, it's just something fun about owning world-class real estate in great apartment buildings that I have seen with my own eyes that I am a fan of. Put in the comments below, do you ever buy stocks just to kind of add them to your collection? <laughs> I'm getting later into the stages of my dividend investing in I have 50 stocks now, but I don't mind expanding the portfolio a bit with smaller positions once in a while. Um, I try to keep it manageable, but as I shared in my last video, I'll put a link to it in the pinned comment below. I went through um, my stock portfolio, my top 10 stocks, and also some characteristics of my stock portfolio. And I shared just how top heavy it is. The top uh, stocks make up the lion's share of the portfolio, but I do have a long tail. And so something like Essex, maybe one day I could see it in my portfolio as an ancillary position. But let's keep going. As you can see on the screen right now, I want to look at their balance sheet. So this is where it gets really fun. I had gone into this just hearing bad things, honestly, uh, about Essex out in the media and um, oh, probably around the fact that just it's off the 52-week high by a whopping 41%. I think when anything like that happens, a stock is not going to get good media coverage. So I was thinking though also, boy, if it's down that much, I bet you that this balance sheet is just terrible. I was surprised. If I look at the assets, they're 12.6 billion. They do have some accumulated depreciation, actually quite a bit of 5 billion. So a lot of depreciation given the scale of their portfolio. But again, that depreciation affects them if they go and sell um, assets. But I don't really look at that as a true um, issue or a subtraction, if you will, uh, um, from a real value standpoint of what they own as compared to the debt that services it. Because what I'm really looking at on the balance sheet here is 
can they service their debt? How conservative or how aggressive are they? And so accumulated depreciation to me is not really a debt servicing concern. And so when I subtract it out or subtract the negative number, I'm adding it back, I get 17.6 billion in the value, real value of those assets. And again, these are carried at cost, I believe. And so the real, real value is probably even higher. I know realty income carries them at cost. There's probably some rule about publicly traded REITs that that's how it's done. Um, but anyway, the real value, should they sell their portfolios, probably even more than is indicated here. Um, liabilities are $6.7 billion. Stockholders' equity, if I just subtract uh, the real assets, not, not doing my weird accumulated depreciation calculation, but the real deal, I got 5.9, but the balance sheet had 5.7. There was a few other weird little things going on in the balance sheet. But long story short, and this is what really surprised me, was the leverage was the same as realty income. They are managing this business more or less on a leverage standpoint, liabilities divided into this kind of assets minus accumulated depreciation minus the negative number. So I took the 6.7 billion, divided it into the 17.67 billion. I got 38%, which is reasonably low leverage and gave me a lot of confidence in this particular company. And so I thought that was really nice to see about Essex. And um, in fact, a fun thing, I've been sharing a lot of numbers today so far, a lot of stuff in front of you. I know it's a lot. Let's just share something a little more fun for a minute. As you can see on the screen now, I just want to show you one of their um, apartment properties. I remember when I still lived in the Bay Area, I don't live there anymore. I now moved to Idaho with my family, but this is a newer property that was being built. And I remember going by here actually a lot. Uh, my chiropractor actually was not too, too far from this location. So I was driving by this all the time in San Mateo. And um, it was really interesting to see this thing go up Station Park Green. And uh, now it's done. They're renting it out. And just look how beautiful it is. And they're renting um, the studios, it seems, for $2,400, $2,489 a month. Um, but it looks like they're offering up to one month free, little incentive there. Um, and all the way up to three bedrooms. And it seems like the three bedroom is a whopping $49.48 per month. But this is a brand new world-class facility. Like, honestly, most of their properties, even their older ones, are quite, quite nice. And so this is at the upper echelons of um, apartments. And uh, definitely something that is exciting to see. And so I hope you enjoyed seeing that photo. I do want to share some fun news from Essex as well. As you can see on the screen right now, this is just their recent earnings report. They had this press release about their fourth quarter and full year results and their guidance. And um, what I would say again, net income, I don't really look at that as much. What I really like to look at is the FFO and especially the core FFO. And you can see it's up 16.2% year over year. That was the main thing I wanted to show is they had a strong year. And so what is so funny is this thing is tanking. Maybe it was just overvalued, quite frankly. I kind of feel now if realty income is at a 15 kind of PE equivalent, I like seeing this at a 14 PE equivalent. And so I kind of feel like... Essex Property Trust now is probably just back to reality, if you will. And some of this tanking probably had to happen with uh, the layoffs, unfortunate, terrible layoffs in the tech industry. Hopefully that industry bounces back real soon. Put in the comments below, by the way, do you own any REITs? Do you own any Essex or Realty Income? I'd love to hear. Or do you have others? that you would suggest that you think are even better than these two. These are two REITs. I, I mean, I own Realty, but I could see myself owning both. I could see myself going for Essex. They kind of fit my personal risk profile. With that, I want to close out the video today just with a few thoughts at a high level about REITs. For those of you watching today who are newer to REITs, trying to learn about what they are. So as you can see on the screen right now, I just want to go through a few basics. And I also have some fun stuff at the end of the video. Even if this is repeat, stick around because I got some fun stuff that I want to share as well. Um, that is a reference to the hip hop industry. I always got to do that in my videos. But basically, what is a REIT? 
A REIT is a real estate investment trust, and they invest at least 75% of their assets in real estate, and they must distribute at least 90% of taxable income to shareholders. That taxable income, it is not taxed at um, the corporate level. It gets passed on to shareholders, and that's why the taxes are a little more complex for shareholders or unit holders because those taxes have to be figured out at a shareholder level. It's a pass-through, largely a pass-through entity on that front, but you will see some corporate taxes as well because they don't distribute distribute all of the taxable income. Now, what is an NNN REIT or triple net least? It's a triple net. It's net of taxes, insurance, and um, maintenance, tenant improvements. And so triple net leases are really cool. That's what realty income does, but that's not what Essex does. Essex is just a apartment REIT. And so those are the basics, but I want to go into some pros and cons uh, with REITs as well. So as you can see on the screen right now, these are some of the things I love about REITs. It's real asset owner ownership in an uncertain world. How nice is it to know that my investment is backed up by real assets, real estate. It's a passive way to own real estate. I'll tell you, I work in the real estate industry and what I do is very active. It is very tiring. It is a lot of work. When I own a REIT, I don't have to do anything. And that is so much fun because so many people are thinking, should I buy an investment property? Should I go and do an Airbnb property? Those are awesome investments as well, but that's very different because that's an active amount of work. It's a lot of hands-on work, but with the REITs, once the investor has done their due diligence and owns a REIT, largely it's a very passive way to own real estate. And I love passive investments because I can use my cash flow to go out and live real life versus work all the time. REITs offer instant diversification. There's a lot of risk these days with single property ownership. Just think of that use case where the investor goes out and buys his or her first a uh, single family home or condominium and then goes and turns around and rents it and just say, unfortunately, that investor falls on bad bad luck and gets a bad tenant. Well, that's pretty bad. There's no diversification and there's a lot of risk there. What I love about REITs is, is that instant diversification and there's predictable distribution income. Now, of course, I have cons as well. There's more complexity around taxes, especially when it's held in a taxable account. And Honestly, it's just um, not that tax friendly. It's tax friendly, I guess, at the corporate level, but at the shareholder unit holder level, the um, effective tax rate, it's higher than qualified dividends. The really good ones, honestly, are utility-like, and they're kind of just lower on the spectrum of high yield and slower distribution growth. Those are the two I share today. They're, they're great yields, but look, they're not going to uh, be that exciting for someone who is more attracted to the very high yields, and the growth is also slow as well. They remind me of utilities. Now, I love utilities. I'm a boring investor, and so I get drawn to these kind of things because I value in my personal portfolio stability, and I'm risk-averse as well, and so that's why I really love things like this. Now, I also believe that higher interest rates, they can affect the financing and profitability of these types of companies because they have to refinance their debt. Their debt gets refinanced at higher levels. It squeezes the margins. They may not be able to pass that along to the customer, especially uh, a company like Essex because the customer might be hurting right now uh, with the tech layoffs and such. And so, um, and just with shifts of, of folks starting to move out of some of those urban centers. Although I was in California and I think the media is just there to scare us these days. When I was uh, seeing things firsthand, Places were really busy, busier than ever. And so I think sometimes there's a narrative that's shared. It's not always the real deal. But I told you I would end on something kind of interesting or uh, fun today. Actually, it's, it's, it's a sad story, but there's a, a silver, silver lining to, to it all. So basically, I'm a fan of hip hop. I listen to hip hop music before I film my videos to kind of get me going, to get me motivated. I was listening to um, E40 today and I was listening to uh, his track, I Hope I Don't Go Back. And in this track, he talks about he doesn't, uh, he hopes he doesn't go back to his life because this is a man that came from nothing and built an empire. He's a tycoon. He's someone, I've been listening to his music my entire life. I look up to him as a businessman, as an entrepreneur, as an artist, as a leader, as a just solid, uh, solid individual. I think he's a really cool guy. And so anyway, uh, he talks about, I hope I don't go back. I, I think a lot of us in this particular group, we're thinking, we hope we don't go back to that bad job or we hope we don't go back to uh, that sense of financial instability, or we hope we don't go back to that time where we, we didn't own any dividend stocks and we didn't really have a plan or a clue of how to get to that next level in life. And so that track resonates with me because I think it's important 
to look at the past, look at how far we've come, and work hard to keep moving forward versus going backward. But I'll tell you now the unfortunate uh, side of things today. The reason I was listening to E40 and supporting E40 today is at the uh, Kings Warriors game. Um, unfortunately, he was he's a lifelong basketball fan. He always sits in the front row, and I think the team, the Warriors, they depend on him. He's he's one of their the kind of main advocates, and he's there cheering on the sports, and he always has a very positive presence around him. But unfortunately, there were some people in the audience behind him who were probably jealous of where he was sitting and jealous of his success that were heckling him. And he stood up, um, turned around, and um, in a he says in a strong um, but uh, polite and respectful manner said hey um, he, he addressed the hecklers and what happened immediately after that to my knowledge is security came and they just they didn't ask any questions they didn't care what happened they just ejected him and you know what uh, shame shame on that security team and shame on what happened there I hope the NBA and the Kings they look into that incident because they ejected the wrong guy um, but that was the negative thing that happen. But the positive side of it is I was uh, really interested in listening to some E40 today, supporting his music and um, learning from the knowledge of his words. And I want to look towards just the future of where dividends uh, can take me. And I have a long way to go, but it is a fun journey. And on that note, everyone, I appreciate you watching today. Please go ahead and click that like button. If you enjoyed the video, please don't forget to subscribe as well. I have new videos on the way all, all the time. Check out my Patreon. It's in the pinned comment below. Before I go, in terms of full disclosure, I am Long Realty Income, ticker O. I may buy Essex, ticker ESS. And um, in terms of a friendly disclaimer, today's video, it's not investment advice. I'm not a licensed investment advisor. Today's video, it's just for your fun and entertainment. If you're going to go out and invest in the stock market or anywhere else, please consult your licensed financial advisor first. I'm just sharing my journey here on YouTube for fun and entertainment. It's possible to lose money in the stock market. Also, I'm not a financial uh, tax advisor. I'm not a licensed tax advisor. Please consult your licensed tax advisor before making any tax moves. Again, just sharing this uh, for fun and entertainment. It's possible to lose money. I love you all. I'm going to see you in the comments below, and I'm going to see you in the next dividend stock investing video. Mm -hmm.